<laughs> okay, so here we are, May 19th, uh, John Paul Andre, Mark Sher and I'm Mark Sheridan, John Paul Andre is uh, joining us from, uh, from Nova Scotia. Um, again, you know our, our uh, emails, I didn't write them down here, but um, John, why don't you just recite your email? John Andre at Outlook.com. Okay. Oh, and, Outlook, uh, 1967 at, no, what is it? I forget it now. <laughs> John Andre, 1967 at Outlook.com. Okay, and I'm mark.sheridan at simpatico.ca. So if anybody wants to contact us, we're glad to hear from you. Okay, so again, um, we're going to pick up where we left off on the little, um, the little uh, gal I was uh, carving that was going to be a musician, cowgirl type of thing. And uh, if you recall, we left it off at taking it off of the bandsaw. And so tonight we're going to show you the roughing out process and some of the initial detail associated with that. And then, uh, so I'm going to do that for a few minutes. And then John, we're going to hand it over to John. John Paul is going to talk about carving and painting a face and take you through a number of slides on that. And then we'll come back to the rest of mine if we have time. I think we will. And we'll talk about adding a little bit more detail to my carving and how I went about adding arms. And we'll finish up. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up the night again by talking about tips, chips, and tricks. And John has a few slides, but if anybody has any tricks and tips they want to share, that's the time to do it. So again, I'm just going to remind you to put your um, your machine on mute. Zen and yours might not be on mute right now. And and so what that does is just uh, it does it just reduces the background noise, but. If anybody wants to say anything or has a question or a comment or a good idea, uh, just take it off mute and you'll have the floor, okay? And with that, let's get started. So let's talk about first the rough out and initial detail. So if you recall, last time we were together, we talked about this little cowgirl and um, we talked about uh, the clay model and how we took the clay model to a pattern that I brought to the bandsaw. And, and on the bandsaw, I, uh, I was able to draw the sort of the, the plan view, the front view, if you want, bird's eye view, cut that out, glue the pieces back on, and then cut out the side view. And so this is where, this is what I walked off with um, from the bandsaw. And then it's a matter of roughing in. Now, one of the things that I think I showed you last time was that on this particular carving, uh, the, the, this gal's uh, right leg is a little bit forward. It's bent a little bit forward and the left leg is a little bit back. And so from a side view standpoint, I needed to deal with that. Um, and so I, uh, so I, I dealt with, um, and actually because the left foot was back, uh, the left leg would have been back here as well. So I dealt with that right off the top, made sure that I carved off just with a gouge, the pieces that I need to, needed to, to define what the left leg was um, back a little bit and the right leg was forward a little bit. Okay, so I did that really quickly. A um, Couple of things I wanna talk about here is first of all, as, as both John and I have mentioned to you in the past, when we rough things out and when we carve our carvings, we really try to spend a lot of time thinking about roundness in the carving. And, and you'll recall, even in the show, little show that we did um, a little while ago, a few months ago, um, one of the critiques that we had was really take a look and take all squareness out of your carving. When your caricature carving is finished, you should have no idea what that block of wood looked like originally. There should be no straight edges on it. There should be no corners on it at all. Um, it should be rounded. And so what I do, and John does much the same, is we continually draw reference lines in the side here. So, so again, just to orient you here, this is the torso, this is the front of the torso, left leg, right leg. And so in this side view, I drew a reference line. If I cut it off, I draw it again. I draw a reference line in the center as well. Now I know that I, to get a round figure on this leg as an example, I have to round everything from there to there, okay? If I just round from here to here, I'm gonna have a very square figure, okay? So keep that in mind. When you're cutting this material away, 
you know, you're, you're probably wise to keep that line there and not remove it every time because you'd just be reducing the size of your um, silhouette. But cut right up to that line or very close to that line. Cut all the way rounded to that line. As you can imagine, on the back of this, I have another reference line running up and down the back of the leg. And so at the end of the day, when I do my roughing, it's, it's completely round. John, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly what we do. Okay. I think you mentioned to me that you you try to keep kind of an eighth of an inch on either side of that line just so. Yeah, yeah. You have just a keep on repeating, repeat until it's perfectly round or mm -hmm. like a limb or whatever. Or like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and try to keep away from, you know, just rounding this edge here and thinking to yourself well okay that's that's close enough that's not what your arm or your leg looks like your leg and around and arm are perfectly round it's not a dowel it's, a, <laughs> it's not a dowel that's right um so the other thing that i want to mention to you is that i i really dislike roughing in a carving um uh, i i find uh, doing it with a knife is takes me too long i find it's a little hard on my elbow to be honest with you anymore I use a Typhoon bit, and so I have a Fordham tool, which is um, very similar to a Dremel tool. It has what's called a Typhoon bit on it. I've shown you pictures of that before. It's, um, you know, it's a high-speed steel um, uh, bit with little carbide burrs on it, and that removes material in a real hurry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you again, because I use this, if you go ahead and use one of these things, you really got to protect yourself, right? You got to have gloves on, you got to have sleeves on heavy. I wear heavy leather sleeves on. I have a, kind of a gauntlet glove on. Um, I have a vest uh, apron on to protect myself. Of course, I wear safety glasses as well. So you have to really protect yourself because if that carbide tip touches you, you become the carving in a real hurry. So, so be very, very careful with that. But you can mark? see that, I beg your pardon? Dust collector? Yeah, thanks. You have your yeah, dust collector? Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I, have a, I work right over a dust collector yeah. and, I, and I wear a dust mask. Thanks for mentioning that, John. Yeah. Really important items, right? Because this produces a lot of dust. So you can see what happens is it leaves kind of a roughed uh, surface. And um, if, if anybody's bought a, a rough boat, it kind of looks like this. If you buy, were to buy a rough boat, it looks kind of like this. You're starting with something like this. And so this, you know, this work, getting it from here to here, oh, that's probably 20 minutes of work, 15, 20 minutes of work. It's really quick. It removes wood very, very quickly. Um, the other thing I like about using the typhoon bit is that you're really sculpting with it. You're just touching the wood and you need to think, well, I need a little more here. You just have to touch the wood. You're not, you're not taking a lot of wood away with a, with a knife. It's just, you're just refining it. And so I find I have more control over the whole process of roughing in. And so as you can see here, and as you can imagine, I had that reference line along the side, along the front of both legs, front and back. I had a reference line down the center. If you recall from the clay model, she was kind of twisted back or, or right, right shoulder back, left shoulder forward, twisted a little bit to the right at the hips. And so I had all those reference lines in to make sure that her left shoulder was going to end up a little bit forward. Her right shoulder was going to end up a little bit back. The center line was going to kind of be tapered down this way. I'm exaggerating here to make the point. Um, I decided that she was going to have a shirt and a vest. So I was able to say, okay, what is a vest going to look like? First of all, it's going to be completely round. I wanted her to have a nice shape on the vest. I wanted the vest to be kind of belled out at the bottom. So you can see the very rough outlines of all of that plus where, about where the belt line would be, her, her, her pants belt line would be, okay? Any questions at this point on the roughing out process or any comments? Can I, can I say something about your you typhoon bit? Yeah. If you wear gloves like you're showing in the picture, you have to be careful with the typhoon bit gets caught in the glove, because that happened to me, it tore the glove, stopped the trap, stopped the Fordham immediately, broke the shaft, <laughs> I thought it was going to break my finger, but it didn't. So be very yeah. careful with a knit glove. 
Yeah, that, thanks for mentioning that, Dave. Uh, that, I, I wasn't using this. I wear uh, actually leather gauntlet gloves, but I'm glad you said that um, because this could lead somebody down the wrong path. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, the other thing I'll mention, if you look in the background here, these are this is the the um, what I used to cut out on the bandsaw. And so I, so I kept that out in front of me. You know, this, this is just the pattern, right? I kept the side view and the front view out in front of me so I could keep an eye on what I was doing here. All right. Let's see if I can go to the next one. All right. So the next steps uh, was just kind of refining that. So once I get the, the form together, the general form together in terms of what I want to do uh, with the typhoon bed, then I turn to a knife. And so you can start seeing the knife cuts here. And I just refer to that original pattern that I had, had drawn out on the paper. And that pattern, remember, was um, based on sort of an anatomy chart from Pinterest that was a little bit um, exaggerated to begin with. It, it, looked, it didn't look like a, 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 you know, your average female anatomy. It looked, it looked like it was an exaggerated kind of like a model sort of a look, very long legs, very short torso type of thing. But I used that to put the, about where the knees would be, understanding one knee would be a little bit long, uh, lower than the other, just based on her stance. You can see I've put those lines in again, but this time I've gone ahead and I've shown where the hip joint is, where the knee joint is, where the ankle joint is and about where her foot would go. And that just helped me identify a whole bunch of things as like, where, where's the mu front muscle and the thigh going to be? Where's the butt going to end and the back muscle and the leg going to start? Where, where's the calf muscle going to be located? And the other thing it really helped me with is what's the boot going to look like? You know, I, I didn't want a super exaggerated boot. Um, doing a female, I found a little bit, more challenging than doing a male caricature because you want her to look pretty at the end of the thing. You want, you know, exaggerated eyes and nose and or exaggerated, well, nose, a smaller nose, but exaggerated cheekbones and that type of thing. And exaggeration in her body. I gave her a big rear end as an example, but you didn't want really big feet. And so I wanted that to look nice. So I actually drew about what a foot would look like within the boot and then said to myself, okay, well, what size boot would fit that? All right. Then from there, I needed to start figuring out where the head was going to go. And so we've talked about this process of etching the wood with a, with a graphite or a, a lead type of a, a soft lead pencil. And so that's what I did. I drilled the hole where I knew the uh, head, the neck was going to be. And I showed where the, you can see these lines here on the top, I showed where the shoulder line was going to be. And then I started thinking, okay, how is the head, which I had already carved, going to fit over that? And how is that hair going to fit over her shoulders? Because I, I want it to meet nicely at the end of the day. And so what I did, oh, the other thing I did was I, I decided I was going to have a scarf. So I just drew in, penciled in a, a little neck scarf here and used a, a small gouge to go around that just to trace the outside of it. So I just to be able to locate it. I pulled away some of the material to show the right shoulder back, the left shoulder forward. And then I graphited this. I, I, I just put graphite or lead on the top, put the head where I wanted, just move the head back a little bit. And that left the graphite on the bottom of the hairline on both sides. And then I was able to slowly start carving that away. Now, I didn't know that the shoulder was going to be like this. This wasn't where the shoulder was going to end up. So I did both ways. I took material away from the head and then I, I carved away all of these lead marks and I put the lead on the inside of her hairline. And then I put the head back down, moved the head back and forth. And now the lead showed up off high spots on the shoulder. And so I was able to carve that away. And so I, I did that in a number of iterations. I may have done that three or four or five times until I ended up with the head looking in the right direction, looking up with the right attitude, like not looking down at the ground, not looking up in the air, but looking at a nice level. And, uh, and I just kept doing that. And this here, you know, I had cut uh, much of that long neck that I had started with when I was carving. I cut, 
cut much of it away. And this gradually came down and down and down and down as, as I carved away the shoulder and a little bit more of the hair until it sat where I wanted it to sit. And so after doing that, this is what it looked like. And so after, um, you know, I've done the typhoon uh, sculpting, if you want, I've come back with a knife. I've done a little bit of um, etching with graphite or lead to drop the headline down onto the, the hairline onto the shoulders. And so this is what it looked like at this point. I narrowed her, her uh, waist down a little bit. I knew I wanted a, a shirt back in there. So I started carving away some of the shirt, Le left a little bit of material because I knew I wanted the shirt over the belt at some point. And that's what it looked like there. The, the next step was to add a little bit more detail. So you can see here, I've redefined a little bit of the um, scarf and the lapel and the knot. I've made a little hole in the vest for her arm to come out of eventually. This tier is gonna be flat because that's where I'm eventually gonna hold, uh, attach an, an arm. And then I've started to detail in a little bit of the vest. You can see I've undercut here. I've given it that nice bell kind of curve, nice bell curve here to kind of follow her figure. Um, and then in the shirt, I thought, okay, she's twisting with her left shoulder forward, her right shoulder back. So there's gonna be a, a, a fold that starts about here and runs right up under, under the vest here. And so I, I just cut that in and I cut another fold in here and started the process of, of um, uh, drawing in and just with stop cuts with the knife, um, starting to develop a belt. And I had the belt so that you could see the, the leather belt at the front, but it kind of disappears as it goes around the back. So the, the shirt is gonna be over the belt. And then, a, and then just, a, just a shape at this point for, for the belt buckle, okay? And no Any flat, questions? no flat marks. Any mark? It's all nice and round. Nothing yeah. flat. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. I, I should say in this as well, John. Like uh, one of the things I really admire your carving. You you seem to be able to carve with one stroke and it's done. I I don't do that, and um, yeah. I I wish I could be better at that, but I don't. Uh, I tend to start, you know, think pretty rough getting a little cleaner, but still not clean. I, I, I probably take three passes at something before I get it to the point I want it to be at. You know what I mean? So in, yeah. here, as an ex in here as an example, that's, that's pretty coarse there. So I know I'm going to be coming back and, and I'm going to be shaving that down a little bit more. Yeah, but I know that, yeah, I know you're very good at, uh, <laughs> you know, taking one cut and, and walking away from it. I, I wish I was the same way. Okay, and so at this, this mark, pardon me. There's nothing wrong with that. It's coming along. It's look. You can see the progress. It's looking really oh, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's maybe why I do it, Daniel, is because I I'm not quite sure what it's going to look like at the end. So I leave a little meat on the bones, and I just keep coming back and trimming it. You know. Yeah. Um, one of the things I do try to avoid though is making too deep a cut on anything because, you know, if I if I had made a real deep cut here and later found out that I wanted to move it, no matter how much of this material I pull out, I'll still have that deep cut. So my, my cuts prior to a stop, like the stop cut, you know, before you make the side cut, I keep yep. them pretty shallow. So I still have a little wiggle, wiggle room, you know. Okay. And then the next piece is um, I did a little bit more work on detailing in a couple of things. I won the scarf. So one of the things that, uh, again, I learned an awful lot from looking at Lynn Doughty's uh, photos on Facebook or his website, outwestcarving.gallery.com. Um, you know, he, he does such a good job on these Western characters. I look, a, I, I look a lot at the photographs. I should spend more time on his videos because he has excellent videos on YouTube, but his photographs are worth a million words. And so when you take a look at the way he does a scarf, like he just doesn't do a plain scarf. He'll come around the edge like this, but then he'll say, you know what? This larger part of the scarf is going to have a fold in it. So he'll make a cut in here and some stop cuts into that. And then he'll take a gouge and say, 
well, this isn't going to be straight across and he'll just take the gouge and he'll move it. It does a much better job than what I've shown you here, but it, it just makes the scarf come alive if you put those little gouge marks in and, and maybe another cut down here to show different folds and the neck and the, the neck portion as well. So, you know, you could easily walk away and just leave it plain, but nobody really has a, a scarf that's tied like that. You see some kind of fold in it. So here I just made one simple cut there, uh, relief, provide a little relief to that uh, cut there, made another cut starting here down, provided a little relief, just gives it a nice shape. And, and you're really glad you did that when you get to the uh, painting stage, because it really gives it a, a new dimension. Well, that's where props come in too, right, Mark? If you wanted to uh, tie up a scarf on a on a pole or something, and just tie it exactly the way you would want to carve, or on a on a, a human, then uh, you take a couple of pictures of it and carve it the same way. Yeah, you can see thought. the pole. Yeah, I never thought of that. Good thought. Yeah. Um, when I was talking to my daughter. Um, and showing her where I was going on, and she said, oh, she needs a fringe on the, uh, on the vest. You know, a country singer is going to have to have a fringe on the vest. Okay, great. So we made a fringe. And so you can see here, I just drew in a pencil mark, a light pencil mark where the fringe would go. Uh, I cut in a line here that became a line that I would do again, stop cuts on. So I cut up to relieve it here. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but you can see now, this section is lower if you want in the upper section. And then with a V-tool, a very small V-tool, I just pulled away some material. That was really quick. I just started here and used my V-tool to draw it down this direction. I just went all the way around. Uh, later on, you'll see I went in between the, the different valleys there with a, a burning tool. But at this point, that's just a, uh, a V-cut. The thing I wanted to mention to you on this is that, you know, that's that's all fine and good. Like you could have just, you know, I, as I did, you just make the, the line there and then you use the V tool. But I thought to myself, that fringe is going to flow like a flag. It's not going to all be just straight down. So how can I make that happen? Well, you can see here, I just took a gouge. So I just gouged in a valley here up to that line. There's another gouge here up to that line, another gouge here up to that line. So now that whole thing kind of undulates like this, all right? And it just, it just, if you can see, you might not be able to see it here, but you can certainly see it once I, I started painting. You can see it a little bit here, but all the way around, instead of just a straight fringe, now you have a fringe that looks like it's free at the ends because it's undulating back, back and forth. So think about little things like that. That, uh, that to me just, um, those are little details that only take about three minutes to do makes so much difference uh, when you're at the painting stage and you really get to see that difference in, um, you know, between from carving to carving. It makes your carving stand out at a show in particular. So you can see here, I added a little more definition to the, uh, to the wrinkles, trying to think, okay, what, what, which way would a wrinkle go? Again, she's twisting to her right. And so it's gonna pull all the way across, not just to where the seam where the buttons are, it's gonna pull all the way across. Now you could have just left this piece rounded, but that's not the way clothes go, right? When you look at your clothes, some of the wrinkles in your clothes are very abrupt, like this deep line here. Some are just are just flowing. They're just, you know, they just, it's just a, a, a wave, if you want, in the material. So I just used a gouge, and you can see on the top of this here, what well, would have been just a rounded piece, I just made a gouge mark. And so now it flows, and I did that in several different places, and you can see it here as well. So I have a, a hard line here where it's creased, and then a flowing line here. And, and think about that when you're, when you're doing uh, clothes. Okay. Okay, so this, um, this uh, picture is to demonstrate we all make mistakes. So when I, when I carved, or when I uh, brought this to the bandsaw, one of the things that I realized too late was because I had, uh, I'll bring it back to this, because I had um, one leg that was a little bit different than the other, it was kind of up, up, up on her toes. When I brought it to the bandsaw, 
and cut it off, I ended up cutting too much material off of this, this shoe. And I started shaping this shoe first, and I really liked the distance between the bottom of the sole and the top of the, you know, the lower leather por portion of your foot. This one, I didn't have that much room. And so I had to say to myself, okay, am I going to cut down a boot that I really like the shape of because I don't have enough material, or am I going to add more material? So what I did was I just made a nice flat cut in here, took away the little bit of material that I was taking away, and I added another piece of wood. So I just glued in with white glue another piece of wood. You can see just a clothespin is clamping it down. But now I had the amount of wood to deal with to make it look like the other boot. Okay. So I I, I put that in to, to just kind of reconfirm with everybody it's okay to clean to to clean up a carving and add a piece of wood you know you know carvers like uh if you know fred zavadil from um from western ontario world-class carver world-class carver he'll say to you look at do you think i don't make mistakes it, you know and he uses sort of the etching process the graphite process to make nice tight fits when he's got to replace a piece of wood don't don't ruin a carving or have a carving end up less than you wanted it to be because you ran out of wood. Just add a piece of wood, right? Any comments, questions? I hope you're still there. Okay. Um, so the, the other thing I'll mention is um, doing the boot is really important. Like people, when you look at a carving, uh, at a show, T take a look at different carvings at the next uh, show you go to and take a look at the feet. And somebody who has carved a shoe or a boot that looks like a shoe or a boot stands out in terms of the carvings because many of us, and, and, and I've done the same, uh, carve the foot on, oh, geez, I got to get the foot done. You know, I've done everything really well, just get the bloody foot done. And you end up with a squarish foot or an oval foot. Nobody has a square or an oval foot, right? And so give some thought to what the, the shoe has to look like. And then pick up a shoe out of your closet, your favorite dress shoe out of the closet, and take a, flip it over and take a look at it. And right away, you'll notice that, you know, the toes are going to be in different shapes. Some will be pointy, some will be square around it. But the instep always looks like this. The instep is a gradual curve and then a real drastic curve into the arch of the foot. The outer step is a very much more, a longer, more gradual curve that meets right at the heel, okay? So, so look at your shoe and, and try to mimic that because it'll make, if you get the sole of the shoe right, right away, the shape of the shoe is gonna be right. You can't go wrong. And so get that sole of the shoe right and, and work from there. And so that's what I did here was I, I said to myself, okay, um, I want this shoe size to be the same as this shoe size. So I just took a piece of paper after I got this shoe the way I wanted. And I said, okay, I'll take a, I, I think I just took a, um, a pencil on its edge and a scrap piece of paper and I just etched it on, cut it out, put it on this side, make, making sure that it was the same size. And now you can see the point I was making to you earlier. Like that's a pretty good looking boot. Um, you know, that looks like a boot. It does, it's not a square, you know, piece of uh, uh, wood on the end of a leg. It's not uh, an oval piece of wood. That looks like a boot. And it's because I, I made sure that this outer contour was that gradual contour that I talked to you about. And if you could see the other side, you can see it a little bit here, although I was still working on that on that one when this picture was taken. But the other side has that arch coming right in. And it really makes all the difference to um, how the boot shapes up. Once you do that, give yourself a healthy sole. You know, you want a <laughs> healthy sole. That sounds great. Um, <laughs> give yourself a, a nice thick sole here uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, it looks nicer than a real thin sole or no sole at all on a shoe. The second is you need that thickness because you're working at the end grain of the wood. The grain of the wood is going this way and it's easy to um, lose that once you make this cut. So make that cut very gently, make that cut very gently and then do stop cuts into it. If you're, if you're 
this sole is too thin or you're getting too, you're getting too close to the end grain, it's just going to break off and you're going to be disappointed in it. But if you do it right, you have a nice sole, sole of the boot here, cut in a real uh, delineation between the sole and the upper leather. And what you can see is here, this is flat. The upper leather extends beyond it just a bit and is rounded like this, okay? So it looks like your shoe. So don't be afraid to take your shoe and put it on your, uh, on your carving table and look at it as you're working on it. And as you can see here, you can see, again, you can see remnants of that reference line. That reference line, I made a bootstrap at the top. You can see a reference line here. Always putting the reference lines to making sure that when I carve this, it's going to go from that reference line right to that reference line. Then I added in you know, a little bit of undercutting to make a differentiation between the upper boot and the lower boot leather. All right, folks. And that's where, and at this point, that's where I ended up. So. Uh, the only thing I added in this picture was just a little bit of um, uh, wood burning. So now you can see the wood burning in these individual fringes. I used a little wood burning where I had, uh, you know, shown the button line around the belt, fly of the jeans. And then I, I emphasized some of the, uh, you know, the upper leather and the, the boot straps and the upper part of the boots with a, um, with a wood burning tool. All right. Okay, any questions on that at all? Because I'm going to stop there for now. If there's any questions or comments, that's great. And then we'll come, if, we'll come back to it a little bit in a few minutes. Okay, that's great. Right, Graham. Okay, and, and you're on, John. So, uh, so we're going to talk about carving and painting a face. And, and these uh, are slides that uh, John's providing us. Okay, John? Yeah, ready to go. Oh, yeah, this you're is on. my... Uh... What I was doing was um, uh, carving from the corner. So I made um, I made uh, a bunch of heads here, <clears throat> but I was trying to um, do different expressions and ear placements. So I did a whole bunch with uh, longer jaws, longer foreheads, different ear position, different eyes, just to change it up, just to... Um, you know, practice on different things, different things that I want to do in the future. So this one, I started out with just, uh, I shaped out the ears, about the middle of the head, did the jawline, and then I started carving. So the first cut is where the eye is going to be. So I'm notch out where the, uh, where the eye would be, right there, yeah, and then underneath where the nose. So at this point, I, I wanted a that size nose, but I could have made a bigger nose, smaller nose. At uh, this point, I just made it this size nose. So I put another notch underneath the nose, straight down where the, jaw, the mouth would be. And then I go over to the other, the other picture. And then I cut up two notches where the eyes are going to be. On either side of that triangle. Yeah, yeah. I put in two notches there. And I and then I went to the next slide. And so then I split the eyes by going between those two triangles. So that gives me the two eyes. Yeah, that right there. I go straight up from there, straight to the forehead. And now I have the the the, the flat plane right there. It's pretty flat. That's where okay, the, just, the eye will be. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to your last picture. So that was where you yeah. left it with. And then you cut yeah, away you this here from there. Part. Okay. Yeah. And then I, that's pretty flat. That um, uh, where the eye is going to be is going to be right a little lower mark. Right where the eye is going to be. Yeah, right there. That's up and down flat. Yeah. Right where the eye is going to be, though. Right. The little triangle. Yeah, right there. Yeah. That's flat, okay. flat up and down. Okay. Yeah, both sides. And then I, the next picture, I rounded off the nose a little bit. I uh, just rounded the bottom underneath it a little bit. And that's about it for that slide. Next slide, I put the eyes in. So I wanted his eyes. So at this point, I wanted him more, um, you know, the expression I was looking for was eyes bugged out, like really curious. 
So I put two round circles on that flat plane, carved them out, and then I started the nose. So okay, I'm just I'm just gonna go back to this one again, John. So yeah. so so you carved quite a bit out here then. Yeah, right a round circle right there. And all the way down, and, and I made it nice and round. That's an eyeball, right? It's got half a ball. Mm -hmm. And then above that, I made the brow where the brow, uh, the brow bone is. Yep, yeah, right up there, there's a brow. And I, uh, on either side of the nose, underneath the eye, I, I scooped that out right where the cheek is going to be and where the, the nostrils are going to be. Yeah. So then the next slide, the next one over there, is uh, I drew two where the nostrils are, went straight down where the, um, yeah, uh, right there, yeah, a little bit over more, the nostril line. Oh, up there. oh, oh there, you're, there, you're yeah. thinking of this, yeah. The smile line. And then I put the nostrils in. And I, right where the, where the mouth is, I rounded that off. So now that's the mound the mouth mound, a little bit higher up. That's a, yeah, right there, yep, yeah, that's where the mouth mound is. That's rounded half round again. Yep, yeah. and I put in the chin and the cheek, underneath the cheeks, I scooped that out. And I scooped out the ears a little bit too on that one too, right? Yeah, I just put a little scoop in there and I uh, went to the next slide. So now, um, I same idea. I, I keep I kept on refine, redefining, putting the the bags underneath the eyes, putting wrinkles in, redefining the nose a bit, working on the mound, the mouth mound, and the chin. And uh, then I went over to the next one, and I started putting hair, the hair in, the, the hair. Uh, um, Drew, a, drew what hairstyle I wanted and undercutted where the hair is and put it and so his eyes are looking up or, or like this, he's bugged eyed. So I made a little bit of wrinkles over his uh, eyes, get more expression, put the mouth in and, uh, and then I, I worked on the ears. That's good. Okay, I'm going to start you again here, just so we can see the progression again. All right, so yep. I'll just I'll just go through it like this. Hmm. We have the finished one. Is it the bottom next one, next slide? No, the next slide up that. Next slide. Yeah. So did, didn't you want to sh talk about how you finished it? Oh, okay. So yeah. finish was, uh, I used uh, the Minwax wood finish, natural 209 with a little bit of burnt sienna. I bought an inch of burnt sienna. I put it in the uh, uh, can, mixed it all up. That gives me my skin tone. So well, what I always do first is I paint the eyebrow, eyeballs white. and um, then I put all, over the whole thing, I put in that, the Minwax oil over top, let that dry for about five minutes. <clears throat> and then I put a little bit of red on the brush, water brush or water paint and do the cheeks, the lips. Uh, then I uh, do the hair, uh, hair is brown. Uh, but I don't know, all the wrinkles, I take a little bit of black, very, very little, little bit of black water down and emphasize all the wrinkles, all like the small line, under, the bags underneath the eyes. All that is emphasized, but with a little bit of light, light, light black, almost like a dry brush of black underneath there. And uh, I do more like on where the five o'clock shadow would be. I'd add more where the five o'clock shadow would be on his chin. And I underneath the uh, the hairline, the hair, I put a little bit of shadow underneath the uh, the top of the hair. Yeah, there's a little bit of black under there, and where the ears are, 
I black in, inside the cracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in there, yeah. And uh, that's how I do it. But that, that basic startup, I can do all kinds of different ones. I can uh, add, have a bigger nose, smaller nose, different expression, different smiles. Uh, uh, so I'm uh, always uh, creating different expressions. You know, well, the other slides are the more with the different pictures. Yeah, I put them down in in this other tips and tricks, but there. Yeah, so okay. It's it's so that's, the same, it's, that's the same setup. I, I think you got a question there, John. Hold on. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. It's Richard. Can you go back to uh, slide uh, 20, I think it is, where the, yeah, uh, burnt sienna? Uh, yeah. Oil. Has to be oil paint. And you said you just put that in the minwax? Yeah, about an inch. Inch of, uh, like, squared out about an inch into, your, into that can. And now you, can, you, can, you can do small amounts, I guess, too, eh, John, and then you you have different oh, yeah. skin tones. Yeah, sure. Yeah, like if it's not it's not dark enough for you, just add a little bit more. Question mm -hmm. for you, John. Yep. Uh, TJ here. Uh, yep. Throughout your carving, I, I noticed how clean it is. Now, are you sanding as you're going throughout your carving? I never sand. Nope. Okay, thank Small you. Well, a sharp knife. Okay, thank you. No, well, no problem. Now, John, the, the other thing is, you know, you're saying uh, this is all, these are two oil-based uh, products here. But right. after this is dry, you, you do the, the blackening, if you want, or the, the rouging with the red with acrylic, correct? Right. Okay. So you, you, you can put that acrylic over this oil base. Oh, yeah, for sure. It, it and, takes and, like uh, five minutes to dry. That's dry yeah. enough that you can put the acrylic on top. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so that's a sa the same setup for all these characters. Uh, uh, the guy with the teeth is just the same setup. Bigger nose. That's four inches high, but a two, two by two cut on a diagonal, and it's four inches high. So I, I change your hair, but it's the same guy. Same setup. Uh, I, add teeth. I guess I guess the other thing though, John, with with this one is this is where you've put the, the sealer on it, right? I put the wax, yeah, the Howard feed and wax. Yeah. Over top of that. All right. But I create a little bit of shadow. See on, on the teeth, I created a shadow with the paint. See where the nose and the shadow right there, the shadow on the white. Mm -hmm. That's paint. That's paint mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath the eyes, there's a little bit of bags. So all around the whole thing is, is a light, light black. It's very, very watered down, but you just keep, you keep on adding it. If it's not dark enough, just add a little more black. <clears throat> but never go straight black or, or too heavy on it because it'll, it'll look like a black line. You want it to be a shadow. Mm -hmm. You want the shadow effect. So... Right. Same setup, just a bigger nose, same, same head, two by two by four inches. Uh, so all the shadowings done, same thing. Yeah. Yep. Same, same uh, process. So you, you just, uh, you play around with different expression. You want, this guy looks like he's sick and he's got a belly ache or something. You know, you got, you know, you're creating um, a pirate. You can do anything, but two by two by four. But you got to cut out the ears. You can put the ears up. You can put the ears down. Wherever your ears are, right across from your ears is your eyes, so that you you're gonna know where to locate the eyes. Mm -hmm. Your eyebrow. Yeah, that's the original one. So the same thing, that's the guy there, the same guy, all painted up. Do you use the same method on the rest of the carving or just the head? Uh, no, uh, just the head. I've just been doing the head, just doing, looking for different expressions. 
um, different but caricatures. You're, you're, but you're painting though, John, you use acrylics for the rest of it, right? This is, you, you, oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you yeah. just use the oil base for the, for the flesh color. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what I meant. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And the other thing John has said to me many times, and it shows up really well in this particular one, is John likes to see the green in the face here. So you can see here, you can see the green. Um, if you do it more like the way I do it with acrylics, you you, you block out the, vein, the green, rather. This one, you don't see much green, and maybe there wasn't much green in that piece of wood. Yeah, that's... Uh... It depends on the wood, I guess, eh? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. I, I, some pieces are, are darker. And this one was a darker piece of wood. Yeah. Another uh, question. Yep. Go ahead. How, how do you feel about using boiled linseed oil instead of the, the stain? I've never tried it. I, uh, I've never tried it. I, I, I learned this from um, Pete LeClaire, this technique. I, I was uh, working with him, I don't know how shoot a long time ago, 20 years ago, doing a few carvings with him. And uh, he showed me this, and I just love it. I just, this is what I always do. I've never tried anything else. I, this works for me. You find something that works for you, you know, stick yeah. to it, or, you know, if you yeah. like it, right? If it works. TJ, well, TJ the, the only thing I've heard, TJ, is um, – some concern that the boiled linseed oil might break down over time. Now, over time is probably decades, but that's that's the only thing I've heard. Mm. Well, I, I've I've been getting pretty good results with the linseed oil. I mean, it gives me almost the same effect as what he's getting. Mm -hmm. So, no color in the insulate, the, the 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 linseed oil just on the the raw basswood. Yes, sir. Oh, good, interesting. You'll have to send us some pictures so we can show it on this. I've got it. Are I've all got... pieces uh, corner carved? Yes, these are all corners. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you can see my picture, not my camera. That's yeah. all from the corner. Cut on the I like, diagonal. I like, I like the shadow effect, John. That's really cool. It works well. Yeah. Thank you. And again, the you corner. Can use, uh, you can use a, a light brown, uh, you know, uh, a but I like using black. It really pops. It really pops the wrinkles and pops. But you can use a brown, any any kind of dark. Yeah, I know Lynn people, Daughter uses a blue, right? Well, a it's midnight called blue. Yeah, it's called Payne's Gray, but it's kind Payne's, of like oh a, yeah, Payne's Gray. Yeah, Payne, it's called Payne's Gray, P A Y N E, and it's kind of a gunmetal gray. But it, it it does exactly what you're after here, John. Same kind of yeah, notion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, that's great. Where I got it from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the, yeah, he and he does it exactly the, w what you described. Especially, you know, the, the thing I would add is that when he puts a hat on, uh, he recognizes that there's going to be a shadow under the hat, and so that's what he uses that Payne's green there to show the shadow under the hat, right? Yeah, I do that under the nose too. Yeah, to show the nose shadow. People think it's uh, like a picture. It looks like a his shadow but it, i emphasize that shadow yeah good so is that uh pain's gray p-a-y-n-e-s is that what yeah. you're saying yeah, yeah. it's kind it's kind of it's kind of like a uh, the only way i describe it is as a kind of a gunmetal gray and the way it's used is exactly the way john has talked about using this black in that it's it's very diluted it's really watered down and and as john said you can put as many layers as you want on to darken it but yeah, that's pain, yeah, but that pain's gray is exactly the way John described use of his black. And uh, I find it, I find the pain's gray particularly good to show um, sort of uh, somebody who hasn't shaved for a couple of days. So yeah. if your caricature looks a little rough, you know, you got that sort of that blue gray look to the lower face. If you put that on in a wash so that you're not covering the flesh tone, it really looks smart, just, just like what John has produced here. So, so that paint's gray. That's just uh, an, an acrylic paint, like the dollar store paint sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you'll find okay. it. it's a very, very, very common color. You'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? That was a really good review, John. Thanks. Oh, that's good. 
Well, well, I think we ought to bring that one back a couple of times, you know, because it's good sure. to see those reminders and uh, uh, because, you know, the, the bottom line is the, the face is the most difficult part to do with the caricature carving. Yeah. And as we and as we said before, man, you get that wrong, stop. Don't don't bother yeah. working on the body because you got to have the face right. Well, that's why I did all these little uh, four inch pieces and just practice, practice, and do different yeah. expressions. Just continue yeah. on, and if it doesn't look good, the next one will look even better. Then the next one will be even better. So just that's right. Practice, practice. Or else, besides Pinterest, are you finding your your ideas for your expressions at? Well, there is pin interest. Like I'll, I'll take a mouth. If I want to do say uh, an angry person, I'll look on pin interest or books or magazines for different mouths. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, okay. I'll say, okay, I like that mouth. Okay, I'll put it on this guy and I'll, or I like this guy's eyes or this, you know, uh, girl's, cheeks so it uh, all depends on what i want if i want some angry sad i'll look for something but i'm not i won't i'll never copy like the whole carving or the whole picture i'll just take pieces from something and add it to mine okay thank you you know okay thanks john and if anybody comes up with a question we can go back to that anything that john mentioned there just look at my wife if I want to get a really angry look. <laughs> now, you, Daniel, know this is on video, right? <laughs> You're it's, done. Been nice to, it's been nice to have you join us, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me pick it up from there. And uh, as we go through this, if you think of a, a question for John, uh, when I finish this piece, we'll just go back to it. That's great. All right, so at this point, um, left off with the, the little gal looking like that with a little bit of wood burning. Again, the wood burning kind of seals the wood if you have any ragged edge on the carving because of a little burr that was picked up or something the, 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 uh, uh, because of the carving. The, uh, the burning will take care of that as well. All right, so the next step was I needed to add the banjo. And so this was all along intended to be a banjo playing girl. And so uh, what I did was I looked uh, on Pinterest or on the, on, I Googled the banjo, right? And I found out what the regular, the, the normal size of a banjo would be a four string banjo. And what I did was uh, when I found out the length of it, I just kind of measured up my own leg from the length from the floor up to see how big a banjo would be against me. And then I use that to scale how long, how long a banjo would uh, have to be to match this figure's height. So I would, you know, if, if it was, if that banjo only came up to mid thigh, then I, I would only make this banjo mid thigh here. And so I ended up cutting out a little banjo and I told, talked to you before about not worrying about trying to make a perfectly symmetrical drawing. You can see the fold line there, right? So I just took a piece of paper, I folded it, I made a half circle, I made the length of the neck, what I thought the head would look like, I unfolded it and cut it out and I had a banjo. Um, the bottom line though is I took a look and, and think about what John was talking to us earlier about composition of the carvings. I took a look at this and I just hated what it looked like with the banjo. Here I had done all the work to give her a nice slim uh, waist and uh, an interesting vest with fringe on it and the, the scarf and the whole nine yards. And I was covering it up now with a banjo and it was even gonna complicate it when I put her arm up in front of her and her other arm in front of her here. I wasn't gonna see the carving anymore. So the banjo was out. So I thought, well, it's gonna be a ukulele, something smaller. So back to the website, how big is a ukulele? How far up in my shin does it go? Did, did the same sort of scaling against her shid, shin. Uh, I, car, I cut out a ukulele, still didn't like it. Still blocked too much of what I thought was the most attractive parts of, of this particular caricature. So I finally went with a fiddle. And so now I could picture, instead of having the arms blocking more of the carving, an arm would have to be out considerably with a bow Another arm would be hidden behind the, the fiddle 
and with its arm or its hand rather around the neck. So, you know, I, I think just by looking at those three pictures, you know, you'd, you'd agree with me that I made the right selection and it really enhanced the the carving the what the way the caricature figure was going to look by getting the instrument away from her still have an instrument that you would expect a a cowgirl musician to be playing but that really showed off now the rest of the carving okay so then it was make a violin make a, a fiddle found out that the violin and the fiddle are the same things which was an interesting point uh i i decided here, as I just pictured now, um, as I just, did I do something there to make this large all of a sudden? Okay, I don't know what I did there, guys. <laughs> still good. Still see that okay? Oh, yeah. All right, let me Let me just see if I can do something about that. Pinch, pinch the screen, John, or uh, Mark, rather, pinch the screen and, and open your fingers. Yeah, that's what I was just trying to do, but it wasn't working. Ah, we don't thank, want, there we go. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. You get, there, there, there you go. There we go. Okay, got her. Thanks for that. Okay. So um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, so as I started thinking about this fiddle, I recognized that one arm was going to be dangling out here, holding the end of the bow. Another arm was going to be under here. It was going to be a pretty fragile carving. I tend to take a look at my carvings and try to think, how strong can I make them? This was going to be fairly fragile. So I thought to myself, well, this eventually violin is going to be cemented in some way to under her chin and cemented to an arm. So at least I can make the violin strong. I probably did a little bit of, um, of overkill and decided to make the, 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 uh, the fiddle out of maple. Basswood would have been fine, but maple is actually pretty easy to carve if you, if you ever uh, just try to use maple. And so again, I Googled it, found out what the shape of the a fiddle would look like, cut it out of a little piece of maple. Um, you can see, um, you know, the bandsaw, there's nothing, there's nothing miraculous about this bandsaw cut. The, the band was actually a little bit broader than I needed, so I made I had to make a bunch of little cuts in it. But I drew what would be the top of the fiddle. I drew the neck and the sort of this bridge section. And then on the side, you know, just looked at uh, what a fiddle looks like and recognized that it tapers down and you have that scroll end of the head at the end. All right. And then just started roughing it in. And so this was all done with a, with a knife in the gouge and just started roughing it in. When I got it to the point where it started to look like a fiddle, um, I drew in a couple lines here so that I could relieve some of the uh, wood in between would have been the top surface and the bottom surface of the fiddle, make it look a little bit more like a fiddle. Made that scroll section at the end just uh, just an idea of that scroll section at the end. I added a little bit of burning to, to emphasize where um, you know the edges would be. Those F holes, I put those in. I just burnt those in. And so you can burn fairly deeply with a wood burner. So I just use, I just drew that in with a pencil and just burn that in. And then what you can't see very well is that there's a little valley along the edge here. You can see, you might see it, but that's that's a gouge mark. And so if you look at a violin, there's kind of a flat section and then it goes up from there. Same here, it's a bit of a flat section then it's rounded and then a flat section again. So it's hard to see it in this picture, but that's what I was trying to mimic with this. And then it was a matter of starting to fit it to the girl. And so, um, you know, I had already decided where the head orientation was gonna be. I did all that etching early on. And so now it's a matter of just fitting it on her chin. Um, I found out that there are fiddles that have a little chin guard there. Uh, there are fiddles without it. So I did it without it. And so this is, uh, there's no chin guard there that just sticks under her, her chin. Now, one of the things that I did that I'd recommend you not do, and I won't do again, is uh, I used a glue gun, a hot glue gun, and I just put a little dab of hot glue there to stick the violin in place so I could get a sense because I needed to start thinking about the arms. Um, that was a bad idea. That was, 
that, that was really difficult to remove that hot glue afterwards. It was really gummy and I just, I actually had to carve away, uh, you know, some of her chin here, her jawline to get that, that glue out. So I thought it was a great idea to, to just tack it in place with hot glue. It was not a good idea at all. Don't do that. And then based on that, I had to make the arms. And so, as I said, I knew one arm was going to come down low, be bent at the elbow and the wrist so that she could hold a, a bow. Um, and so I did something I hadn't done before. I just went to the original anatomy chart that I had printed out and I just cut out that arm because the arm gave me the length of the shoulder to the elbow, elbow to the wrist, wrist to the fingertips. And I just made the bends. So I just held the shoulder there. I made the bend at the elbow, made the bend at the wrist. And that was able to give me a good enough pattern to go to the bandsaw and draw that, draw that arm. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, one of the best ways that I've seen done it is people will take sections of cardboard or a popsicle stick and they'll just put a pin through the elbow, a pin through the shoulder, pin through the wrist with a popsicle stick or piece of cardboard, the right length for the hand, forearm and an upper arm. And then you're able to manipulate uh, because it's hinged at a pin, you're able to manipulate it up and down and then just tack it where you want. I use this method. It was quick. It worked for me this time. And then with those um, little patterns, I, I went to, again, um, uh, my basswood so that I could cut it out on the bandsaw. Now, I had thought at the time that on the arms, this would be uh, a hand. This would be the shoulder. This would be a hand. This would be the shoulder. I thought at the time I was going to put a little bit of a frill on it. So I added, I added a little material so I could make little frills on the end of her sleeves. I later decided not to do that, but that's why you see that same frills. I oriented it so that this was the direction of the green, as you can see by the arrows in the green itself. And so then I eyeballed it and I said, is that going to be strong enough? I, I like this arm. This, is the, this would have been her right arm holding the end of the bowl. And I liked it because the green runs right through the elbow. That'll never break. The, the troublesome spot would be right here. And I put a question mark there just for this purpose of this presentation. But that's where it, the, the, the wrist is going to be pretty slim at that point. And the green is a cross green. So if it's going to break, it's going to break there. So that, that was a little bit troublesome. Um, I, to be honest, I didn't get too uptight about it because I figured this was going to be a fairly uh, more fragile uh, sculpture than when I've some of the other ones I've done so I left it like that um, Mark, I, yeah can I just interrupt for a second um, I've been noticing uh, watching different artists and that uh, more and more um, a lot of them are using cyanoacrylate or some people call it crazy glue and yeah. they're just they're soaking the wood in in a in a fragile area yeah and what that does is it, is it it gives it strength and so that you don't need to worry about that situation. Yeah. yeah. And apparently it works with, I don't know, I, I haven't tried it yet, yeah. but I've seen yeah, it. No, yeah, I've seen that done. Another thing you could do, um, you know, I could have just cut that off as well, Daniel, and then just doweled that in with the grain going in the right direction. I left it like that. The, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on, uh, on glues by any chance, but I do know from, from my other hobby in radio control modeling, a cyano is used a lot. It's very volatile. It, fl it flashes like mad and it's just something you don't want to breathe. And so if you're, if you're, if you're soaking wood, um, you know, I can picture using a lot of it. I wouldn't want to breathe that really, unless I was outside putting it on and didn't go near it yeah, until it was hard. Yeah, that's when it gets, it's called cyano actually, because that's cyanide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have to you have to be careful with it, but it does seem to seem to be working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the okay. only problem with doing that is when you go to paint it, it's uh, a hard surface. It, you won't the paint doesn't. Uh, you'll if you want to see the grain through the wood, you won't see it in that area. It'll be a hard finish. It'll one thing. Different... One thing that you can do if you decide to soak it. If you have an old fish tank, I learned this because I used to be a police officer and that's how we 
would get our fingerprints time after time, but yeah. you you could uh, put that uh, in a fish tank and and it would uh, stay there and you wouldn't have to breathe that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah. Okay. But John, John, you have a very good point. Uh, like, like I said, I haven't worked with it or experimented with this yet, but it just, I would just bring the, bring the point up. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but it, it definitely is uh, harder. Yeah, but agree. It won't, the paint won't uh, soak in. Okay. The other thing that I did a little differently on this than I've done in previous carvings is I is I made this pattern on a fairly deep chunk of wood. So that's probably about an inch and a half chunk of wood. Normally, I would just have used a piece of wood that was no thicker than the, the diameter of the arm that I was going to be making. Uh, with this one, I just wasn't sure how the arms were going to be oriented. And so I used the, the thicker piece of wood. And so as you can see here, I took that to the bandsaw. I left these pieces, picked them up again, glued them on the bottom, used this base here to cut now the, the direction of the arm, use this base on the bandsaw to cut the direction of this arm. And again, leaving those and just tacking them in place again with a little bit of white glue and taking them to the bandsaw just gives you a good stable base to go to the bandsaw. So this isn't rocking back and forth otherwise. Um, so with that, there's there's her uh, her left arm, and so I just I just drew in the direction of her left arm. As I said, um, for all of my other carvings, I would have just used a piece of wood that was that thickness, and just um, beveled this edge. This one I little did a little bit differently, and I and I um, drew in exactly where I wanted the arm when I had the violin in place. And then I was able to take this whole piece to the bandsaw and cut that and cut that. Was a, it was an okay way to do it. It wasn't uh, my best idea in the world because what I did was I introduced a little bit more weakness by, by, by introducing some more cross grain there. But nonetheless, that's what I did. And here's how it ended up. And so now I've got this flat surface against the shoulder. I made a flat surface on this arm and I just held them together to see where the hand was gonna end up to see if that's where I wanted it. If I wanted the hand a little bit further in this direction, I would have modified this cut here on the arm, this flat section on the arm and moved it in a little bit. Now, John and I were talking about this and we both, we both have uh, you know small belt sanders, uh, uh, desktop belt sanders that have a flat belt on the top and a four or five inch disc on the side. Uh, both of us do the same thing. We take the shoulder to that four and five inch disc and we just we just uh, sand that down so they have a nice flat surface there to start with. You can sand this preliminarily down as well to have a flat surface there. Now I have to make sure that that flat surface on the shoulder matched the flat surface on the arm and that there was absolutely no gap. And so I used the method that we used for all of the other things with the graphite um, uh, or the lead etching and just continued to find the high spots and whittled away those high spots. So you can see here, I put a little dowel in here. This is a 3 16th inch dowel, just goes a little bit into the body. It's cemented in place. This is a fairly shallow dowel because I knew I was going to have a fairly shallow sh arm here and I didn't want the dowel coming through the arm. Um, I, I put a little bit of uh, lead or graphite on the end of this dowel and then held the arm up to it where I wanted it. And that took that graphite and left a nice little circle on the arm where I needed to drill. And then I drilled that in and now I had those two fitting together. I then brought it over here and, and I made a line that would show me exactly where that arm had to be tilted up so that this hand ended up on the fiddle. And so every time now that I put this arm onto the dowel, it wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't going up, down, forward or back because it's tight on the dowel. If I line those two lines up, I knew that's exactly where I wanted um, to trim material off so it would fit perfectly. And I'd reduce that gap you see there to zero. So I took my lead, my graphite, and I put it all around that dowel. I put the arm onto the dowel, made sure those lines were lined up, wiggled it back and forth 
a little bit, took the arm off and found that on that that uh, sanded flat on the arm, there were little there were little spots of graphite that were transferred. Those were the high points. I took a, a gouge and just took those high points off. Nothing more than those high points. Put it back on the dowel. Wiggled it again. Took it off. There were new high points showing up on the graphite. Took that graphite away. Probably did that four or five or six times until that line was reduced to zero. And then I knew that when I go about um, gluing at that point, that's that's going to be a, an airtight seam there. Okay. Does everybody understand what I tried to explain there? Okay. And so that's, that's the way it looked at that point. I started trimming away. You can see this frill. I still have it in, in this picture. I've taken it out. I've taken it out in this picture. I didn't like the frill, um, but you can see that I've got the arm in. You can see here that I started to, to uh, carve out where the hand was going to come around. The thumb would be back here. The hand would come around here to the top of the violin. The way I did that was I put the graphite on the underside of the neck of this violin, touched the arm to the hand rather, to the violin, could see where the high spot was, carved it away until I had the fit that I wanted. And, and you can see, you can't see in this picture, but you can see a little bit in this picture, I was able to get that fit to make it look like that for her pointer finger, her first finger was touching that neck. And that was just using that graphite lead method, okay? The other thing I wanted to mention to you is, is the hand itself. So, you know, I, I wanted the hand not to look too bulky, but it, it is a character. So I wanted it to look a little bit large, but I wanted the fingers to look right. So you can see here the, I made it, you can just see the thumb around the back there. You can see the pointer finger that's actually touching the neck. These fingers are off the violin. So she's just playing one note if you want on the violin here. And so, really important to take a look at references for hands and you don't have to look very far on Pinterest or Google it to find a whole bunch of references. So here's somebody put a reference for artists in, in drawing a hand. Now, this is a good reference for what I want to talk to you about. But if you take a look at this particular um, uh, sketch, good sketch, just missed this first knuckle. So, you know, from the fingernail to the first knuckle, then there's the second knuckle, then there's the third knuckle, but it gives you a sense of what I want to talk to you about. This is my hand. So keep in mind that the best hand reference you have is at the end of your arm. Like look at your hand. If you want your hand to be in the, uh, the carved uh, hand on your figure to be in a certain configuration, make your hand like that. And then look at your hand from all angles. Um, the, the thing I wanted to mention is when you start with doing a hand, you, you don't try to do the fingers right away. You take a look at the planes. So here's one plane that you could carve as a flat. Here's a second plane that you could carve as a flat. Here's a third plane that you can carve as a flat. And so it's the same thing as my hand. Here's one flat plane. The first knuckle here is a second fat, flat plane. Here's a third flat plane. And then the finger, then the last knuckle to your fingertips is the, is the last flat plane. So you can just go flat, 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 get that right. Make sure that when you look at your hand, you see a couple of things. One is that each knuckle and each finger, it, they're not straight across, right? The, your, your middle finger is the, the tallest of all of them. So you're gonna get a curvature there. If you look at your hand, you know, from the wrist uh, towards your fingertips, with your fingertips pointing away from your eyes, you'll notice that this is curved as well. This isn't flat across, this is curved as well. And the hand after you think, you know, after you um, uh, do this plane, you can choose by the position of the fingers to make that flat or curved. So look, look at all of those things. The, um, the, the final thing that I'll mention to you about the hand that, that I find helpful is that you can't see very well here because of the bone or the veins, but you know, there's a bone, you, you can see it in your hand. They, they run from the, your knuckles back to your wrist. There's probably meat back here. Or so there's a fulcrum point. You can see them here in this guy's sketch. It's the top of each finger is the knuckle. Um, and so what I do is I don't worry about, you know, how do I carve a knuckle? What I do is after I've done the planes and I've cut in the fingers, then I just take a gouge 
well, first of all, I make a little uh, drawing. I make a point here and I just make pencil lines to each finger so it looks like a fan, rake of like a fan of a rake. And then I just take a gouge and I just very, very shallowly gouge between those pencil lines. And what that does is it produces the back of the hand with a little bit of bone structure, but it also produces these knuckles for you automatically by using that gouge. Okay. And so that just makes your, that makes, uh, I find that makes the hand a little bit more interesting if you do that. Okay. Then I worked on the next arm. I did it exactly the same. Well, I didn't do it the exact same way. The same principle. I used a dowel. I marked off where, where the arm was going to be after I matched it where I wanted the, the bow string to be, or the bow rather to be. And then I, then I put graphite on one side. I let it show up on the other side. Once I put the two together, I took off the high points where the graphite was uh, transferred. And I did that three or four or five times. Now, I'll show you something that I learned when I did this one. I put, I cemented the dowel into the body and then I had to keep it fairly short because I didn't want to go through here. What I found was when I was doing the graphite transfer on and off, this arm was wobbling a little bit more than I wanted it to, just because it didn't have very much purchase here on this dowel. And so when I did it the second time, I did the opposite. I made a small hole in there, but then I cemented the dowel into here made a deeper hole in here. And now when I put this dowel in here, it was solid. It wasn't wobbling at all. And so it was able, I was able to get a real nice transfer without the arm wobbling around. Okay, you don't want the arm wobbling around because you'll end up chasing the high spots until you have no arm left. Okay. And then the last, I guess I'll show you, the, the other thing I'll, I'll mention is, um, you know, on, on some carvings that you look at, we, we think of ourselves as adding an arm and a shoulder. You're not, right? You're just adding the arm. The shoulder is back here. And so if I, if I had left this here like this, I would have had a hump on the end of the shoulder, like a massive bodybuilder shoulder. That's not the idea. So this, once it got, once I got, uh, you know, these flats, nice seam there, like a no, like no seam there, then I started carving this down and I carved and I followed that line right down. So it came right down like that. So, the, so there was no differentiation between the arm that I attached and the shoulder that was left on the, on the body, all right? And then it was a matter of working on that hand. And so I had left myself quite a bit of wood because I knew that hand was gonna have to be upturned and I, and I, I took a, a meat skewer, a bamboo meat skewer, uh, just from the kitchen. And I just laid it along that violin and I laid it underneath the hand until I understood where that hand needed to be positioned. And as you can see, the hand had to be positioned up. So it had to be, re the wrist had to be pulled back and the hand up slightly. And you can see here, the, I've got a little bit of a roundness to the back of the hand, a bit of a roundness to the back of the fingers. I've started to, with the lead pencil, just kind of give myself a little bit of reference where those planes need to be long before I put the fingers in, okay? Follow that okay, folks? And then that's where I ended up, and that's where we'll end up uh, for, for tonight. So uh, that is the little meat skewer. Um, you can see I, I was able to, to get the fingers just kind of nice, the, the pointer finger down and the thumb holding the end of the bow, uh, a nice curvature here, all done just by looking at reference of, uh, of um, hands, making sure I was taking care of the whole plane, the flat planes of the hands before I put the fingers in. And then again, you can see I made the mistake again of putting a little bit of dab of a hot glue gun there. I wish I had and I'll never do that again. It ju it's, just, it's just too messy to take off later. But, uh, but I just did that to position. And here you can see, you can still see the line that I was using back in here. This is long before I've, uh, I've uh, glued this in place permanently, but that's the line I was using to line up. And, and here's, here's the line of the shoulder that I was telling you about, right? So, so it's not adding an arm and having the arm look like this, like another shoulder, the shoulder's about here. This is just an extension of the arm. So it's, it's flat. It's uh, on the same curvature as the, the top of the person's shoulder, okay?
If you hadn't used that hot glue, what would you you have done instead? I don't know. Maybe maybe just uh, maybe just tape, like masking tape or something like that. Um, you know, I, I, I have used uh, just a dab of white glue, but you got to be careful with that, too, because that white glue sets up a lot faster than you think. And, and it's a lot stronger sometimes than you think when you go to take it off, you take a little bit of the wood away. Uh, probably probably just tape or even elastic bands or something like that. Be, because because it is on a dowel, you could put an elastic band across and it's not going to kind of slip up the seam because the dowel won't allow it to, right? So I think I'd do it that way next time. Uh, the, the, the hot glue was, a, was clearly a mistake. I won't do that again. Maybe if somebody else has had good experience with hot glue, I, mine I made a mess of it. Okay, folks, any questions on any of that? Okay, so let's turn to tips and tricks. And John, you, you had a couple of things you just wanted to talk about here. Yeah, I was just talking about expressions and stuff and doing, like I was just saying earlier, <clears throat> they always say like, uh, I forget who said it, but the uh, exaggeration of the truth. So if somebody has a big nose, like if you're doing somebody's uh, caricature of somebody, your neighbor or your friend or whatever, right? Uh, you want to exaggerate the truth. If he's got a big nose, make it bigger. If he's got big eyes, that's what caricatures are about. Make him bigger. If his, his chin is low, like a maroney, make it bigger. You know, and uh, so what I, what I was doing, I was making all these guys. I was just practicing on different expressions and different uh, location of eyes and ears and just playing around. And I did like, uh, probably about a dozen of them. So, and different painting techniques. I, I, and uh, and the hair, I, I did some different things with the hair. I usually do uh, more finer. This time I did more clumpy, like more big, bigger clumps of hair. So it wasn't, uh, I'm not, not clumps, but um, what do you call it? Strands kind of, eh? Yeah. I wasn't I'm, so not, I'm not sorry. exactly a hair. I'm not exactly a hair expert, John. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mark. I should have wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the shiny part, I uh, yeah, know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but this, guy, this, this guy uh, here, this guy here would be great at Halloween, I think. Yeah, yeah. See, the, yeah. His, his jaws longer. Yeah. And the other guy on the right here is um, his forehead is uh, higher. Yeah, just, just have a fun, just have fun and uh, relax and enjoy it. And, and you'll, you'll never know what you're going to create. You know, you'll just keep on going. Um, that was fun. And OK. Yeah. OK, guys. Are all those heads rounded at the back or are they flat? All flat. OK. You could you could have made them round, but I just. I would just. Uh, I put them on little bases and uh, like the, right here. Right. I just, yeah, but you couldn't mount those on a, on a body though, right? No. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to do is uh, make a picture frame and uh, put a, you can put a body on the, on the picture frame, like a little uh, arms, whatever. And uh, Pat, put a read on a picture. Next next uh, month, I'll have a couple done. I'll, I have a little frame around them, paint it black or paint it. I was even thinking like uh, a seat or a pirate here. I do a little painting in the background of uh, a ship or something, and this have this on 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 top on the on the face of the of the picture. Okay. And have it all framed in, nice little painting. I'll have a couple done for the next time. Kind of like three D art. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Folks, well, thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh, enjoy your carving in the next uh, in the next month or so. And John and uh, Murray and I will be back next month and uh, we'll we'll take it from here.